Genius. Fighter. Sharp. Genius. A winner. Ledge. Nobody's familiar with Sir Alex Ferguson. When Sir Alex arrived from Aberdeen in the autumn of 1986, Manchester United were in decline. They hadn't won the league since 1967 and found themselves second from bottom in the old first division. Ferguson set about overhauling every aspect of life at the club, bringing discipline back into the changing room by eradicating the destructive drinking culture. The players didn't really know a lot about him. One player who did was Gordon Strachan, who played with him at Aberdeen, and a lot of the United players asked Strachan what it was like, and he sort of laughed and said, oof, you know, there's going to be a big change of scene here. He gathered the players in the small gymnasium at the cliff. Uh, he said, I'm not happy about this culture of drinking. I'm hearing things around Manchester from people saying, you've been spotted out, I don't like what I'm hearing, it's not professional. And there was some resistance to that change. There was, well, this is what it's always been like, this is what it's like at every club. And maybe it had been, but that wasn't how Sir Alex Ferguson wanted it to be. He scared me to death, pretty much. Um, I, I played under fear, I was, I was always fearful of, of one of his hair dryer tellings off, I didn't want to let him down. Probably Liverpool was the worst one when uh, he sort of kicked me out of my house, told me at half time he was kicking me out of my house and putting me back in digs and my girlfriend had, had moved up from Birmingham, she had to go back home and, and we had to split up and uh, my dog had to get sold, uh, my car had to get sold um, and, and I had to go out there and prove to him I could play. To execute his root and branch reform, Sir Alex transformed the scouting network and youth setup. United's success for the next 27 years will be built on homegrown products. I think Brian Kidd, he put Brian Kidd in charge of the youth uh, in a local area and he, he just got loads more scouts and they got loads more active. All he kept coming up and telling the likes of me, maybe the likes of um, Paul Ince, maybe even Dennis Irwin to an extent, and all players in that kind of time is a. <coughs> These players, i.e. Nicky Butt, Paul Scholes, um, Gary Neville, David Beckham, we're going to be taking your places soon. He believed in what was coming through, you know, and, and it proved that he was right. Yeah, I mean, sometimes, I mean, when we were playing reserve games, he'd be watching, and after the game, win, lose, he'd come in and, and say his piece, but he'd always, you know, knock on that. You know, you are looking to play for the first team, you're one stop away from playing for the first team. Say it was a bad game, you'd all have to improve. He was there at the nights, you know, with the youth team players after being with the first team. You turn around, he sat on the on the bench next to you. Of course, the, the players look over to the bench, look, oh, the managers, and, and obviously they, they play harder, they play faster, they want to impress him. He was everywhere. Just that force of energy and ambition and drive then lifted the whole club. Everybody else then was infected by that same sort of drive. Manchester United, the history from the Busby Babes and everything was about the youth and, and really that core of homegrown players gave, the, gave, him the, gave them the spirit of Man United back, yeah. Initially, Sir Alex's shake-up didn't have the desired effect. It is widely reported he was close to being sacked after a rocky start to his fourth season but the Manchester United board stuck with him. In 1993, United won their first league title in 26 years, adding to their FA Cup, League Cup and Cup Winners' Cup triumphs under Ferguson. At the heart of his success was Ferguson's skillful man management. His reputation as a fearsome dictator kept the players on their toes, while his softer side earned their loyalty. He knew how to, to give you a rollicking, you know, to put his arms around you, comfort you. Um, that wasn't that often, but um, he just had a, a unique way of, um, of getting his point across. Steve Bruce's um, wife, Janet, was in hospital. She was having a back operation and we're playing, the, we're playing. So Brucey left his mobile phone on during the game, yet it was on and we're coming at half time Things weren't going well. This was at Old Trafford. So we're sitting in the dressing room and Steve's phone goes off. So we're all sitting there and I'm, we're all kind of going, 
like that, kind of, whose it is, and I knew it wasn't me. I knew it wasn't Dennis, because Dennis, Dennis did have a phone. He was never switched on anyway. Big Pete, straight away himself as normal going, it wasn't me, you know? And maybe his eyes go and giving away who it was. And you could just see everything quiet. And you looked at Brucey, and you could just see in Brucey's face and persona, it was me. The gaffers ran across, grabbed the phone, had a go at Steve Bruce. Steve Bruce had a go trying to tell him that this is, my wife's in, I don't care if your wife's in hospital, and just threw the phone against the wall towards the bin and smashed the phone. When Sir Alex used to get on my back, it used to make me play better. We were playing Leeds away and I got absolute um, bollocking at half time. And even being honest at the time, I was thinking, I thought it wasn't that, wasn't that bad, but um, so I went out. We, won, we ended up winning the game, come back in, and then one of the, the younger lads come, come up to me and was like, um, oh, you know, like when the gaffer just give you a right go, they said, he come round and said, uh, I'd be all right now. <laughs> in 2008, Manchester United's midfield dynamo, Darren Fletcher, was diagnosed with ulcerative colitis, a debilitating bowel disease. Terrified and embarrassed, he confided in Sir Alex Ferguson. Obviously, I'd experienced a different side of Alex Ferguson during my illness, and I've got the utmost respect for him because he took football out of the equation and, and looked after me and made sure I looked after my family. United dominated the 90s, winning 13 major titles, with Ferguson building two trophy-winning teams. This process of regeneration wasn't just limited to the players, he had the foresight to introduce forward-thinking coaches to help execute his vision. When I got the call from uh, Alex, as he was then, I was at Derby County. We went into his wonderful office. We sat down and directly asked me the one question of the interview. How do I keep my team number one? And I answered, uh, think, behave and train like you're number two. And that hit the spot. And, he, and his next question was, when can you start? Sir Alex made a decision. He decided to double up pre-season training. Um, so in, instead of leaving all the players to just lie around on the sofas in between morning and afternoon sessions, we cleaned out one of the rooms at Carrington. I put in some products which were effectively loungers. So at least up to 12 or 15 of the players could, could go in there. And that was principally the first ever time that a conversation had been had with a club like that or anybody where we're actually encouraging athletes to nap, that wonderful word, to actually take a controlled recovery period, go to sleep in between sessions and to see the levels of if they went a little bit quicker in the afternoon. But it was, it was kind of so early days, people started to knock on the door. Sam Allardyce at Bolton, Arsene Wenger and Gary Lewin at Arsenal, the England squad. He was open to all the methodologies that he thought might help to make his players the best they can be. And I had a, an open book to be able to work with the players all the time. So I went into the club to do some rehab training with Roy Keane and we ended up producing boxing training, which was really important. So it was a step different. So we've got your weights, you've got your various, you know, abdominal core stuff or whatever, but then you've got boxing training. Something new was happening all the time. I think it's gym specific gym stuff, and it's not necessarily just banging out weights, it's all types of stuff, you know, certain leg movements, um, mobility. Um, and, you know, we, we did bring that in early doors, and a lot of it was for, you know, preventing injury. By the time Sir Alex Ferguson called time on his glittering career at Manchester United, he had won 49 trophies in the most successful managerial career Britain has ever known. His unrivaled achievements owe much to his insatiable desire for success and unique fashion sense. You see some of these managers, they're preening themselves or they're, they're, they're very aware of their image. They're, they're a bit vain or they, you know, they're very image conscious, you know, whereas he was very just the values conscious and the, and the people conscious. So I, I remember that they won the European Cup in Moscow you know, and, it, and it, it chucked it down in it and, and uh, the John Terry slipped because it was wet. And they had these Paul Smith suits and shoes, especially for the thing. And it was soaking the grass when they come in. So these were pointy shoes that probably didn't really suit him at all. And, and, and they, they, by the time it got wet, they curled up. They're like Alibaba shoes, you know. So it came to the sort of big do, the banquet at the end. 
and he's doing a speech at him and David Gill stood there. And he's got a pair of white trainers on with his flash, with his suit. And it's almost like, yeah, he doesn't give a damn about it. You know, it's just the people here, all these sort of families, like the, by that stage, the big granddad, the whole of his whole family. It's like, yeah, what's that matter? You know, I could do it in my slippers, this. He was a master of coming in at half time when you were drawing or losing. And when you didn't expect him to go mentally dead, when you expect him to go mentally, he was calm and you go into his tactic boards and he pinpointed one or two little things and that was usually the difference to go and win the game. So it's hard to explain because a lot of what he did was very simplistic, but other times the true genius came out. So he mixed and matched really and some of his team talks before big games were, you know, hair standing up on the back of your neck stuff and you went out there with so much pride and passion and desire to do well for him and to do well for yourself and to do well as part of the club that, you know, that brought the best of us in big nights. Driving from the cliff to Old Trafford the day after they won the league, and he was on the phone, you know, talking about a transfer. And you're thinking, he's not stopping, you know. This guy's not stopping for a minute. He's like, right, when you go to the next thing. Once the final whistle blows on that league, or the, okay, you celebrate for the night, but it, there's almost just like an anticlimax. You've done all the work, and now there's a sort of anticlimax. And, and he, he was like, straight on to the next thing. He was incessant, you know, he, he just wouldn't stop. You just won the treble. You keep the same players again. The motivation might be not there as much. You know, if you start signing a few players well, and looking to get in the team, it just all kicks on again. Ferguson's win-at-all-costs mentality was critical in helping him restore United to their former greatness, but it was his ability to observe and understand the human psyche that truly defined his leadership. He used to get there at 7 o'clock in the morning, and he would be overlooking the car park where everybody came into, but also he would overlook the training pitches. So he would see every player get out of the car and see what mood they was in. So he's watching all his players all the time. Ronaldo had a real tough time for the first 18 months to two years where the manager tried to toughen him up and when he, when he kept on to the ball too long and he wasn't delivering it into the box and he was beating men's two and three times and his end product wasn't quite there, he learned the hard way, there's no doubt about that. Um, he got kicked, but that was, that was a way of telling him that if you do this, you're not helping the team and, and you're going to get kicked in games. I think he'll be the first to tell you there was a tough school at Manchester United at the time. We all experienced it, I experienced it. And I think that was part of what made him the best player in the world. And he also had a desire to, to achieve things for Alex Ferguson, who respected greatly and his teammates. So I'll tell you right now, Ronaldo loved every moment of his time at Manchester United. He was like a personal coach for everybody in the club, whether it be the gate man, the tea lady, the secretaries, each player, he had a personal impact on them. He, he touched them personally. You know, just small things, even, you know, he put a hot spoon on the back of the groundsman's neck and, the, you know, at the lunchtime and he thought, oh, what's this? But that groundsman then goes away and tells all the lads in the off in, in the groundsman's hut and tells his wife at home, and they think, that Fergie, you know what he did today? Bloody hell. And it's like, uh, it's a personal touch. And he had that personal touch with everybody, which made it feel like a family. He definitely meddled a, a little bit, uh, not completely. You, st you still got a rollick in. It's actually after he retired, and um, it was at his golf day, and I came over and I said, "Are you doing gaffer?" And he said, "No, no, no, it's not gaffer anymore. It's uh, it's Alex." I said, "Well, gaffer, I can't call you Alex." because it's, you know, it's not in my nature and he still gets called the gaffer now because um, all the players have so much respect for him and, uh, and rightly so. Genius. Fighter. Sharp. A winner. Ledge. Genius. <laughs>